Shopping for knives can be really confusing and a lot of that is due to the alphanumeric word vomit used for naming steels. X50 CRMOV15, ZDP189, SG2, Chromova18, VG10, they're useful if you have an idea of what they mean, so let's give you an idea of what they mean. Over the last few months, I dove down a particularly deep rabbit hole to hopefully try and break them down for you in a way that makes sense. Wish me luck. It all begins with iron. Iron is soft, so it dulls quickly, and it's also reactive, which means it rusts easily. If you take that iron and add carbon to it, it makes the iron harder. In cookware, we refer to this combination as carbon steel. And because it's harder, carbon steel can be made thinner than iron without bending. It still loves the rust, though. The more carbon you add to the steel, the harder and more brittle it gets. If you take that carbon steel and add chromium to it, specifically above 11%, you get what's called stainless steel. The iron in the stainless steel still likes to rust, but the chromium usually beats it to the punch, providing a kind of shiny force field. <laughs> chromium also makes the steel softer, and the more you add, the softer it gets. A good steel for kitchen knives is balanced between the toughness of iron, which will dull quickly but won't break, the hardness of carbon, which stays sharp longer but breaks easily, and the corrosion resistance of chromium, which protects the iron but makes the steel softer. Most steels are designed, patented, and produced by large foundries that sell them to individual manufacturers. Modern steels bring in other elements like molybdenum, vanadium, niobium, cobalt, all sorts of stuff to achieve a range of effects, everything from increasing edge retention to avoiding other foundries' patents. After all that, it's still important to call out that just because you have the best steel doesn't mean you're gonna get a great knife. The geometry and heat treatment applied to that steel can either completely ruin a knife or make it greater than the sum of its parts. There are dozens, dozens, if not hundreds of formulas, and there's no way I could fit them all into one video. So I'm only gonna discuss the most common ones, and even those I'm gonna break up into groups. Stainless steel knives are by far the most prominent in the US because you don't have to be quite so careful to keep them clean and dry. You'll often see knives labeled as just high carbon stainless steel. The phrase high carbon really just refers to any steel that has more than half a percent carbon content, but that's literally all modern knives on the market, so it really means nothing. The important thing here is that you just shouldn't buy from a brand that won't tell you what kind of steel they use. It's dead simple for any competitor to figure out exactly what the steel is in a lab, so the only reason to hide the name of the steel is because they're embarrassed of it. It's kind of like the foundry version of pleading the fifth. One, two, three, four, five. Kind of related are the like in-house names. A lot of companies like to rebrand a steel to make it sound proprietary. Miyabi takes ZDP-189 and calls it MC-66. Global buys a steel from Aichi, which is probably AUS-6M, and rebrands it as Chromova-18. This shit absolutely drives me nuts, but at least there are some resources where you can get a rough approximation of what the steel is. There are a ton of steels that all essentially match a formula by ThyssenKrupp called 4116. The most prominent of these are called X50 CRMOV15 and 1.4116. I'm just gonna lump these all into a category called 4116, and what makes 4116 special is that it's extremely corrosion resistant. Unfortunately, that's really all that 4116 is good at. In industrial testing, it takes last place in both edge retention and durability. Despite those downsides, it's by far the most common steel in Western knife making. Wustoff, Zwilling, Henkels, Victorinox, Ikea, they all use it for basically every knife they make. Even some of the new DTC brands like Our Place and Maiden use it. My hypothesis as to why they're all using this shit steel is because rusty knives are a bigger PR scandal than dull knives. You'd think that if they wanted to make kitchen jewelry, they'd make them prettier. As is, it's basically just for the perverts who insist on throwing their knives in the dishwasher. If a knife description mentions Solingen, German steel, or anything along those lines, it's almost certainly a 4116. Over the last decade or two, VG10 steel has really risen to prominence in chef's knives. Manufactured by Takefu Steel in Japan, VG stands for V-Series Gold, and there are a couple derivatives on the market, including Shun's VG Max. True to its name, VG10 is Takefu's golden child, and it's developed a name for itself due to its high corrosion resistance and high hardness. Unfortunately, VG10 was copied so much by Chinese foundries that Takefu stopped selling it to manufacturers outside of Japan. In general, if you see any brand advertising 67 layer VG10 Damascus, it's safe to assume that they're a drop shipper that's just hawking AliExpress knockoffs. Honestly, these knockoffs may very well perform similarly to VG10. Being from Japan doesn't make a knife better. Being from China doesn't make a knife worse. My issue is just the way that drop shippers and their get rich quick schemes are flooding the bottom of the market with noise. If for some reason you want VG10 in particular, my best advice is just to buy from a reputable shop or a brand name. AUS-10 is manufactured by Aichi Steel, which is a subsidiary of Toyota. It performs somewhat similarly to VG10 in that it's capable of high hardness and corrosion resistance, but it's available to more manufacturers, which means it tends to be good performance for cost. Misen and later Headley and Bennett have put it to particularly great use in their knives, which are some of our favorites to recommend. 
Remember we said chromium made steel corrosion resistant, but it also softened it? Carbon steel gets none of that. It's harder on average and tends to hold an edge longer than stainless steel, but the trade-off is that you really have to be careful to keep it dry. Although, contrary to popular belief, you don't actually need to oil it. Japanese knives tend to be kind of the poster children for carbon steel, and there are three main classifications, SK, Aogami, and Shirogami. SK is softer and tougher than the other Japanese steels, and it comes in a few poorly documented grades. Because of its durability, it's commonly used for tools and larger knives like the Chinese side out or chukabocho in Japanese. Shirogami, also known as white steel in English, because shirogami means white paper in Japanese, is the purest broadly available form of carbon steel for cutlery. It's basically just carbon and iron. It holds an edge incredibly well, but it's also brittle and it's prone to rusting extremely easily. It comes in three grades, one, two, and three, with one being the hardest and three being the softest. Sarah's Daily Driver is made with shirogami number two, and while it's fantastic to use, it's definitely prone to chipping, and at one point we actually broke the entire tip off. Some folks say shirogami is hard to sharpen, but we've actually found the exact opposite to be true. It only took about 15 minutes of hand grinding to get an entirely new tip back on that knife and blend it into the rest of the profile. Day-to-day -day maintenance is super simple too. Algami, or blue steel, is essentially white steel with a tiny bit of chromium and tungsten added to increase wear resistance and corrosion resistance. Just like shirogami, algami comes in three classes, one, two, and super, which adds vanadium for even better wear resistance. All that wear resistance means algami should hold its edge for a very long time, but it's also notorious for being hard to sharpen due to all that wear resistance, because what is sharpening if not intentional wear? My personal favorite knives are made of a carbon steel called 52100, which was originally developed for ball bearings in high pressure applications, and therefore it's commonly called a bearing steel. It's been documented in use as far back as 1905, and it's actually still the most commonly used bearing steel today. Knives have been made with it as far back as 1940, and it's popular with knifesmiths because of its broad availability, its high hardenability, and its high carbon content. It's a simple steel with a good balance of hardness and toughness, and high-end knives like the Kramer by Zwilling Carbon line and Steelport's entire range are made from it. And then there's Damascus, which is just two or more steels folded over and over on each other like a metal babka. Then they're dipped in acid, and whichever steel has more carbon content turns darker to give it visual contrast. Technically, this is just known as pattern welding. Metallurgy PhD Laren Thomas, author of the blog Knife Steel Nerds, recently conducted a study on the properties of pattern welded steels with his father, Devin Thomas, a pioneer in the world of Damascus steels and recent inductee into the Cutlery Hall of Fame. Their conclusions were fascinating. They found there is some indication that certain extremely high-end Damascus steel knives forged into a particular pattern called the ladder pattern exhibited signs of increased edge retention at the cost of decreased toughness. They also found that knives where the two steels contained varying amounts of nickel would wear at different rates, producing a tiny serration effect. The overarching conclusion though, is that Damascus is never greater than the sum of its parts. In fact, its performance is the average or slightly worse of its two steels and the number of layers added no benefit. But that's just the really high-end stuff. In mainstream knives, most Damascus steel is wrapped around a solid mono-steel core. The Damascus never even reaches the edge of the blade. So there literally can't be any benefit to the performance. It's just expensive because the pattern is so wild. And rightfully so! As I said at the beginning, there are a lot more steels than just those, but that covers most of the bases for what's popular in the US in 2023. There are a ton of specialty steels that I got samples of for the review, but didn't choose to cover here because honestly, they didn't make a practical impact. But we'll get to that soon enough. 